Well, hello, um, everybody. Uh, nice to see you back. Um, this is the first Thursday of July, and so it's Pastel Estates Wine Chat with Wendy and Barry. Um, I'm Wendy, one of the owners of Pastel Estate, and Barry is here, uh, but he is uh, not physically here in front of front of us. He's on the comments, at least I hope he's going to be on the comments, sending lots of uh, likes and hearts my way so that I know he's here and supporting me. Um, he is actually in uh, Perth in quarantine on his way back to the vineyard, so excited to be on his way home, uh, but unable to join us while he's, he's locked down in his quarantine. And we're unable to send him some of our lovely wine to enjoy while he's there, so hopefully he's found something that he can enjoy for this wine chat. Um, on his uh, on his room service menu, um, but anyway, um, really nice of you. I can see some of you like sending me likes and, and hearts. Thank you so much. Please send me lots of comments. Otherwise, I'm going to be jabbering to myself, making it up as I go along. Uh, and if you send me some comments, at least I can respond to them, and it'll feel a little bit more like a wine chat, even though I'm home alone today. Um, so this this month, we're going to talk about um, the King of Margaret River. Uh, which is, of course, the Cabernet Sauvignon. And actually, while I introduce Cabernet Sauvignon as the Margaret River uh, specialty, I'm going to pour myself a glass um, of the 2017 Cabernet Sauvignon just to be holding while I chat to you. Um, oh, it smells so good already. Mm. Mm. Oh, that is a fruity, fruity bouquet, but we'll come back to, come back to the tasting notes a little later. I thought it was really important um, if we're going to be talking about Cabernet Sauvignon. Oh, hi, David. Thank you for joining again. I really appreciate it. Um, I thought it was important if we're talking about Cabernet Sauvignon uh, and Margaret River that, that we mention the special place Margaret has on the global stage as a producer of Cabernet Sauvignon. I mean, increasingly renowned uh, for this varietal. Um, and, and it's a combination of the fantastic maritime uh, climate. And hi, So. Thank you for joining in. That's a lo lovely comment. Very nice of all of you to keep me feeling uh, that I've got some people to chat to. Thank you. Um, but as I was saying, Margaret River, um, wonderful uh, maritime climate with those cooling breezes helping us have lovely long ripening during what are generally nice, warm, uh, sunny ripening months. Um, combine that with the fantastic soils of Margaret River, those gravelly loams and granites, um, and you really do have um, a sensational combination of factors for producing a really beautiful uh, Cabernet Sauvignon, um, and the world has, has noticed this, and, and I'm sure many of you know some of the incredible, uh, well-established producers in Margaret River who have really made their mark and made the mark for our region on the world stage with some of their um, highly acclaimed Cabernet Sauvignon. And hi, Kate, thank you very much for joining us again. Um, so um, I think it's really important to acknowledge that, first of all, that Margaret River is um, an incredible place for producing Cabernet Sauvignon. And we are blessed, of course, to have our little patch of paradise right in the heart of the Margaret River wine region. Um, in fact, um, when we talked to uh, Bruce, our wonderful winemaker, about our, our Cabernet Sauvignon in particular and our block, um, he calls it, and I think I've said to this to you before, and oh, hi, Richard again, sorry, hello. I saw that you popped into the tasting room today to buy by the three-pack special, six-pack special. That is amazing. Thank you. You'll have to let us know which one you decided to open, the 16 or the 17. Um, uh, but anyway, I was saying, and I think I've said this before, but Bruce calls um, our plot of land Christmas cake uh, for Cabernet. So um, it really is it, in the heart of Margaret River where we've got, you know, I think we're three or four kilometers from, from the coast there. We've got that lovely maritime breeze coming in. Um, beautiful spot right on the border of the unofficial demarcation between what they call Willie Abrupt sub -white region and Warcliffe sub region and we are literally on the border Ellenbrook Road is the border so you know we couldn't be blessed with a better location to produce Cabernet and we have happily produced some stunning Cabernet um, uh, I guess unlike Bordeaux a lot of the Margaret River Cabernet Sauvignon is a little bit purer of an expression in, in that we less frequently as, as a region are blending it. You know, a Bordeaux classic blend would include a bit of Merlot, some Cabernet Franc. Um, many of the, the producers will blend a little bit, usually a bit of Merlot, um, if anything, uh, but some really don't. And Pastel Estates, uh, Cabernet Sauvignon are all completely 100% single varietal Cabernet Sauvignon. So extremely pure in terms of the expression of this varietal and, and, and where it comes from. Um, and indeed, when we made our very first um, uh, vintage in 2015, uh, the very first gold medal we were awarded right off the bat was for our Cabernet Sauvignon. And of course, the very first reserve that we produced was our reserve, Lot 71 Reserve Cabernet Sauvignon. So it's, it's a very special um, varietal 
for any Margaret River producer, but, but certainly also including us. And hello again, uh, Will and Karen. It's so lovely to see all these familiar names and faces popping up. I really appreciate you joining. And I hope you're not disappointed that it is just me jabbering away. I'm hoping Barry will get more vocal on the comments just to keep you a bit more distracted. Um, but, but anyway, um, that, that's a little bit, I guess, about um, our special place as a region and also our special place as, as an estate. Hi, Joe. Thank you for joining. Um, so I guess I guess I should start tasting, and, and I can't believe I'm going to have to taste two varietals all by myself. I'm going to be quite tipsy by the time we finish this, so if I get a bit unruly, forgive me. But this is the 17. I thought we would start with the youngest. And Richard, I think you're the only person on who I know has got... Oh, you've said you've opened both. I love it. Brilliant. So you're joining me as well. I'd love to see what you think. I'm starting with the 2017. Um, so um, as... Um, as many of you may recall, 2017 was quite a challenging vintage for Margaret River. Um, it was very wet. We had a very, very wet season from start to finish. Um, and as a result, uh, a very long, very cool ripening season where we still were getting some of that rain. So it was quite stressful for uh, many of us producers. Um, it, it was a late harvest. We were battling uh, the increased risk of disease, of course, in some pockets of the region because, because with all the rains and the cool uh, weather and the longer hang times as the, ripe, the, the grapes are trying to ripen, um, we really were on a knife edge uh, with, with keeping disease out but getting our grapes absolutely perfectly ripened. Um, and and you know, it was very hard. Some, some estates um, had more trouble than others. Um, I guess some kept their cool, some lost their nerve. We have a fantastic farmer, Andy Ferrero, um, and although he was, um, you know, his usual gravelly self with me throughout the entire period um, with his support we really held our nerve and we were blessed at the end of it with an Indian summer which ended us finished ripening to perfection and get the grapes in and, and into the, into the press um, in absolutely beautiful condition I mean we had particularly fragrant gorgeous fruit so despite the challenges of this vintage it is one um, uh, to be treasured uh, I think uh, and if you find a producer that's managed to hold their nerve and, and produce a, a lovely uh, um, harvest that year, despite the conditions, then you're going to be rewarded with some really beautiful, really beautiful wine. Um, and actually, I'll just, I'll just say this too. Um, I was really touched when I was, I was having a look at, to see what some of the critics have said about our wine in preparation for this live stream. Um, and the wine advocate, of, of course, has given us 90 points consistently for our, for our 16 Cabernet and also our 17 Cabernet. Um, but Joe Sowinski had an early tasting of this 17 at the beginning of the year. Um, and uh, one of the lovely things he said in his review was that it's, and I'm quoting him, more generous than, than many of his peers uh, for that particular season because it was such a difficult season. So we were rewarded uh, for our courage, if you like. Um, and, and you can really, I think on the bouquet, Richard, it would be interesting to know if you agree with me. Um, you can really, it is very fruit first, very fragrant um, a, a wine, um, even though, of course, it's a little on, on the younger side still. Um, hi, James. Thank you for joining us. Um, so, you know, we had this challenging vintage, but we, we, we held our nerve. And I guess I should also talk a little bit, um, even in the best of times, um, Cabernet, Cabernet is a, a, cheeky, a cheeky grape, really. Um, the grapes are, are, are quite you know, round and solid, and everyone talks about them being quite robust. That, you know, they're not as um, sensitive or easily bruised the way a, a Shiraz or a Pinot Noir is. But um, as a vine, it is finickety. It gives you a really small window in which to harvest and make a really beautiful Cabernet. And we are literally talking a couple of days to get it right. Um, and if you're out by a day, um, you know, game over. So, so during the harvest, and this again, <laughs> particularly stressful in 2017, because it was such a long, slow, painful, terrifying period, um, we are testing, you know, almost daily, we're testing the grapes, we're testing for the sugars, uh, we're testing for the acidity, we're tasting um, to try and make sure that we pitch perfectly uh, the morning that we're going to harvest. Um, and what we're looking for, of course, is that real center point where you get the perfect black currant uh, fruit compounds and flavors. A day early, it's really green. A day late, it's starting to get a bit jammy. I mean, you literally have this small window. So, so um, Cabernet, um, for all its reputation, can be quite difficult to manage, let's put it that way. Oh, and Richard, thank you. You're saying it's beautiful in the nose, fruity but not heavy. I agree with you, it is lovely and fragrant. And of course, it's young, so it's gonna be nice to see how that develops with some time. Um, and David's asking why the picking window is so short. Oh, David, you must ask me a difficult question when I'm on my own. I don't know. It's Cabernet. It's a feature of Cabernet. I think it's because they, you know, they're quite small, round um, berries, uh, and they're evenly ripened. When we're, when we're farming the Cabernet, we're making sure the canopy is giving even coverage on both sides. It, it's a little bit different to how we would farm, for example, the Shiraz. Um, and I think, you know, 
that, that sort of all those lovely fruit flavors that we're looking for in that small, quite compact berry, the long, compact uh, bunches, just mean that it's, it's, a, it's a small window when it, when it passes through its development stage and, and we are hitting, we're hoping to hit that perfect midpoint. So that's probably the least scientific answer um, I could give, but I think that's why it is. And of course, if anybody knows better, please feel free to educate us in the comments. And, um, uh, and if I find out any more about that, I'll let you know. But I think it's literally, it's literally just a feature of how they ripen um, and we don't have much time if we want to capture it at the point we do want to capture it at, which is that, that centre midpoint. I, I think um, in some of the cooler climates, you'll find a slightly greener style of Cabernet. And that, I think that is partly because uh, people are picking a little earlier in that um, window because it's cooler, because they have the longer hang times and we have those pressures on us to get it in before we, we, we sort of flip over into disease and other, other problems. So I think um, some winemakers may deliberately pick a little bit earlier than us, depending on what they're striving for, but we are always looking for the, the center point. Um, so, and so, um, as I say, I think, I think we got it right with the 2017 and hopefully with all of our wines that uh, you, you get to taste. Um, and it was, it was a tough one. So um, should I have a sip? Should I take a sip? Somebody else take a sip. Richard, take a sip. Tell me what you think of it. Is anybody else drinking a Paso Estate Cabernet or are you drinking um, other, other varietals perhaps from Margaret River? Mm. Mm. Oh, it is young, but it's still already so, the tannins are already so soft. And um, another Bruce word, of course, which I borrow always, is velvety, but it is velvety. Beautiful velvet, soft tannins, um, really yummy. Um, and of course, the way we make it, um, it, it once, we've, once, we've, once we've harvested, we're getting that fruit in the early hours of the morning, getting it straight into the fermenter. We just split the berries, um, and it spends 12 to 14 days on, on um, at fermenting, and then we press it straight into the barriques, you know, the, the ordinary sized uh, oak barrels, um, all French, of course, and about 35% new for our, for our Cabernet, um, and um, for our core Cabernet. Um, and it spends, it, it goes through its secondary fermentation in that um, barrel, and of course it then ages for, uh, in the case of these cores, these lovely cores, about 10 months uh, before we refine it and, and bottle it and uh, let it age in bottle for a bit longer before we, we release it to the world. Um, so that's how, that's how we make our, our beautiful Cabernet. We're sourcing uh, the barrels um, from Cooperas using um, primarily oak from the, and I'm going to mispronounce it probably, so any French speakers forgive me, but from the Tronquet forests, which of course are traditional Bordeaux uh, oak as well. So we're, we're, um, we're using quite a traditional uh, approach for our Cabernet to try and make this really beautiful, beautiful wine. Um, I'm going to taste it again. I don't know, um, uh, uh, Richard or anybody else who's tasted this. Um, there is a little bit of graphite in there. You can, people talk about the classic Margaret River Cabernet as having a sort of um, a blend of, of, of lovely herb, herb characteristics, uh, not green, but herbish, herb, sage and herbs, blended with the, you know, the blackberries and, and the black currants. Um, that's a very traditional cassis style, I guess, uh, that, that, that is common across Margaret River Cabernet, and I think I can taste that in here. Um, and that little bit of graphite or a little bit of, um, uh, sometimes even a little bit of cedar uh, sense to it. I know I have read quite a few critics and some winemakers talk about um, brine and, and they have a sense of the sea in the in the cabernets that they're tasting um i guess they're thinking of the, of the influence of the ocean right there next to the property my palate doesn't always pick that up to be honest but it'd be interesting if any of you can um can can, can taste that or, or, or smell that or feel that but um I, a few people talk about that as another characteristic of of a mark river uh, cabernet and um jojo's asking what grilled meat would it go well with oh well of course in our house barry is a fiend for anything red meat and particularly beef. So we have it often with a steak um, and often with um, even a burger, a nice big juicy burger. So I think um, um, we should probably come back later to talk a bit more about what we could pair this with. Um, people talk about pairing it with Margaret River venison, of course. We've got the lovely Margaret River venison farm next door to us. So that's quite a nice, particularly if you've got some truffle or some mushroom uh, with that meat. Um, oh, and Richard's saying you can feel the herb flavors come through in the front of the mouth as well. Great. Great, but in a good way, I hope, and in, in the way we want it to. Um, so it's, it's herbaceous and it's given us that, that structure rather than um, green. Um, and I guess, Joe, another one, salad, if, you, if you're not into the red meat. A nice salad with a Cabernet is one with beetroot, I think. Barry makes a lovely beetroot and goat's cheese some kind of salad, and both of those flavours, the saltiness of the cheese and the beetroot, slightly acidic beetroot, um, 
but also I think go really nicely with, with, with the Cabernet. Um, so, so that's um, and Stefan, mushrooms and aged Parmesan, absolutely, yeah, delicious. And even a bit of blue cheese. I think I, I'm very happy to share blue cheese with a, with a Cabernet as well. It, 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 it pairs quite delightfully. Um, and chocolate. I think we mentioned previously on one of these when we, um, when we did one of our wine dinners, um, we actually paired our special reserve, the 2015 Reserve Cabernet, right at the end of the dinner with a chocolate dessert. And I think some people found that quite surprising, but it was perfect, absolutely delicious. A really beautiful pairing with a dark chocolate dessert or dark chocolate and a Cabernet. Um, yum, really good, really good. So I suppose I'm going to have to put this one down and, and pull the other one. <laughs> and I can't hand on to Barry to chat. Barry, you're not sending me many comments. Where are you, darling? Um, which I don't know why I took another sip. I'm back for myself at 16, so I'm getting a bit, um, getting a bit tipsy already, maybe. So here we are. And just to prove that I am doing it for real, I'm not, I'm not fibbing and opening one bottle and pretending. I have got a 16 here. Can you see it in the, in the camera? And I'm going to pour this one now. Richard, are you doing the same thing? Are you, are you, have you got a nice glass of 16 in front of you, or are you going to enjoy your full glass of 17 first? Now this one, even the colour, actually. Quite interesting to compare the colour of the two. Um, obviously, the 16 is very, you know, it's a year older, so it's very slightly aged, if that's the right word. Um, but it has got a bit more of a sort of a slightly warmer tone to my eyes, anyway, yes, maybe. A, a slightly warmer tone to it, perhaps a little bit more. Well, in our tasting note, we call it garnet and we call this rubies, and I think that's why, because it's slightly, slightly warmer tones to the colour. Oh, here's Barry. It's such a full bodied wine, it can really pair with strong flavours. Excellent. Um, and it certainly can. It can flavor pair with anything um, and it can be enjoyed on its own because it's not too heavy it's not too big it's about 14 percent alcohol hours and, uh, and, and like all of our wines um, we want it to talk past the state we want it to be fruit forward we want it to be um, um, well as we, as I, I use the same expressions all the time we want we want it to express the vineyard and the fruit so so it is it is a gently made um, uh, wine and I always use the word feminine to describe past the state wines but but it is so you can enjoy it even without pairing it with, with some food um, although um, perhaps, especially if you're drinking two different vintages at once, it's a good idea to have a little bit to eat with it. Um, so I guess the 2016 vintage, again, in stark contrast to the 17, was a perfect Margaret River vintage, as I'm sure many of you know already. Um, it really was, and we had a little bit of rain in, in, in the winter, uh, which you know, we needed to give our vines a nice drink as they're, as they're preparing uh, for, for the coming season. And then we had a lovely, gentle, uh, summer, lovely warm days, no heat spikes, no um, no late rains, um, which allowed you know perfect fruit set and perfect development of the grape, and then a lovely classic um, journey to ripening. So perfect. Of course, um, because we're a passionate state, we did have a bit of a problem that year. We we had immense bird pressure, so we had this perfect, perfect. Oh, very soft on the nose. Yeah. It is a little soft one. I don't know if that's because also it's a year older, but I think it is a, and because of the vintage. It was a warmer vintage, a more Margaret River style vintage, if you like. Um, and, 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 and of course, um, that's reflected in the glass. Um, but yes, we did still have some bird pressure. So um, we, we as, as you, I think many of you, certainly the people who have joined today that I can see in the comments, um, know um, besides making beautiful wine, the other thing that we're passionate about, to, about at Passel Estate is our conservation. Um, and, and nature conservation and wildlife conservation, then we have um, all these big blocks of uh, natural bushland that we're regenerating, and, and, and you know, we, we've got the soft release enclosures for some of the critically endangered western winged opossums, and all of that good stuff, which is beautiful. And having all of that right alongside the vines is wonderful for many reasons. It's obviously wonderful to be having nature develop and grow and sustain and, and, and succeed, uh, but it's also wonderful for the whole ecosystem um, but it's good for the vineyard to have such a balanced ecosystem and to have, you know, uh, all the plants and, and, and the birds and the wildlife alongside it. It just gets slightly stressful when uh, the Mary Blossom tree doesn't blossom, uh, which is what happened in 2016. Across the region, there was no Mary Blossom. So all those lovely birds in our, in our, bird in our, in our um, nature sanctuary were absolutely starving. Uh, and we do have bird nets, of course, but normally we would just net around the edges of, of the block um, we don't want to net the whole thing. A, that's very expensive. Bird nets are extremely expensive. But also, we don't want it to get too humid under those nets because then we go back to the same problems we have, particularly if there's a little bit of rain where, where we're risking disease. And so we net around the edges. But when the birds are absolutely starving, in an ordinary season, they wouldn't dare expose themselves and, and fly. I nearly said swim. Fly right into the middle of the vineyard. 
um, to get to the berries. But when they're absolutely starving, of course they do. And so we also had that to contend with, with our beautiful grapes in 2016. But anyway, it was a beautiful vintage and it has produced a beautiful wine. And as Barry says, you know, definitely softer tannins and I think already drinking beautifully. Um, I think it's... Um, I, I, look, there, it is a year older, which, which certainly um, softens things, but, but it's, not, it's not sufficiently a degree for it to be um, just that. There's certainly something to be said for this being a, a 16 vintage that you're smelling and tasting versus a, a, cooler, a cooler vintage in that 17. Um, so uh, again, we make it in exactly the same way. Um, as, as I mentioned before, again, 35% new oak, um, it's all in barrel, 10 months, and... Um, um, Again, yes, great accolades. I think uh, Decanter World Wine um, gave us gave us a, a silver medal for this, which we were really thrilled with. Um, you know, it's our core core cabinet, and Decanter is an incredibly um, tough international competition. So that was that was really uh, exciting for us. Um, and of course, the wine advocate bless them uh, gave us both uh, ninety points. I'm going to have a little sip. So Richard, you're saying it's looking wonderful today. The sun was out, green and fresh. Oh, I'm so jealous that Barry's going to be there so soon and I'm still here, stuck in Singapore. But one of us has to be here. We obviously have a, a wonderful group of um, loyal wine club members in Singapore. And, and with this travel restrictions and this weird pandemic, you know, a bit wary of both of us traveling and, and getting stuck in quarantine. You know, who knows if, if things could go wrong. So that's why we're, that's why I'm stuck here and, and he's on his way. But he's also um, taking one for the team with his 14-day quarantine, I think. Um, and, and, and so Barry's prompting me, the grapes need sunlight to ripen. Of course they do. Mm. And I think, as I said earlier, um, we, we manage the canopy very differently to how we do for the, for the Shiraz because we, we want it to be very even sunlight on both sides um, of, of, the, of these bunches um, throughout both sides of the day. So um, we, do, we take a lot of care for that and, and we do drop, as, as ever, a fair amount of fruit as we're coming up towards harvest because it's imperative that we have completely consistent ripening for that little tiny window that we were talking about earlier, David. We want all of the all of the grapes to be ripening at the same time in that tiny window so that we can enjoy a really beautiful glass of wine at the end of the day. Um, our farmer was explaining to me that um, just a 1% variance on ripeness across across a row, you will taste in the end product. So you know this is why we go to so much trouble in the farming. It's so fascinating and why we do all of this work, dropping fruit, clearing leaves, making sure it's getting the sunlight, and, and just, just ensuring that everything is really beautifully consistent, not just across the row, obviously, but across the whole, the whole block. Um, I should also tell you, I guess, our... Um, oh, Catherine's saying, I have a 2016 Cab Sav. Oh, yes, but Catherine, welcome back. I remember that you had a 15 last time we, we were on, so it'd be interesting to see how, how, you, um, how, how you think. Or you're saying you're getting a lot of alcohol on the nose. Oh, dear. Um, I hope that's not with it with its trip to Macau. Um, hopefully it'll settle and you'll, you'll be able to enjoy it. Um, so Richard, how has the winemaking approach changed uh, in the first few years as you've gotten used to the estate? You know, actually, I think um, arguably, and Barry, um, please comment if you have a different view, less, less about the winemaking approach changing, but more about the farming. We're just getting where we want to on the farming. You know, we... we um, we've had the, 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 the property for some time and, and until we decided that we were going to um, work with Bruce and work with uh, uh, um, Andy and produce Castle Estate wines. We were selling our grapes to neighbouring vineyards um, and managing the viticulture uh, to that end slightly differently. When we decided that we wanted to do what we we're doing, which is producing the best wine we possibly can from our little our little block, um, and we sat down with Andy and we sat down with Bruce. A lot of what we were focusing on, of course, was the winemaking philosophy, but very much the farming. How do we farm this to absolute perfection? Um, and I think um, that's what we've seen developing because you know you can't overnight turn around <laughs> turn around a vineyard. Um, uh, so so year on year, you know, we, we, we've, we, with the work we've been doing on the canopy, um, on, on on the seeding the grasses in between the rows, and um, um, sorry, I'm being distracted. I'm being asked to do vineyard tours for club members. Yes, that's going to be coming in the future for sure, Stefan. For future, we're, we're post lockdown baby steps, getting ourselves back in the group. But that's something we definitely plan for the future. Um, but you know, all the work we've been doing in the vineyard, I think, is what's changed, Richard, more than the winemaking. It's just that um, it, it's taking season by season for, for those the impact of those farming um, those farming precision and focus to to to, to start to show. Um, uh, as we come through the vintages. So it's really exciting times, of course, and hopefully we'll see more of it. Um, if, if we're blessed with the right conditions uh, for growing and harvesting, of course, Mother Nature has a big impact on this as well. So um, I, ho I hope that answers your question. 
Um, Barry, please let me know if you have a different... Oh, Barry's also saying lovely 30-year-old vines as well. Almost, almost 30 years. So we have beautiful old vines. Uh, they're the Horton clone, um, uh, which is... Um, I think there are two clones generally used in, in Margaret River. I think most of the... Um, over the years, it has been established that the, the more premium Cabernet, because of the qualities of the Horton clone, tend to be Horton clone. I forget the name of the other clone. It's got a numerical name. Um, and that this one came in, um, Horton clone was what was first planted in WA in, in Swan Valley, obviously before, before um, Dr. John Gladstone and, and Margaret River sort of planted itself what, just over 50 years ago. Um, Barry's saying the work Andy has done with increasing vine fertility has been amazing. Yeah, he, uh, our, our farmer is amazing. He's amazing um, and, and passionate, and, and, and it's a huge amount of work. Um, of course, we also have a small vineyard, so we don't have economies of scale. We're really just doing what we can do um, to make this lovely wine. Perhaps a more commercially minded estate would, would take some shortcuts, but we're just not wanting to do that. And Bruce loves working with our grapes and, and with Andy for that very reason. Um, you know, it's a winemaker's dream, I think, to... to to have such a partnership with, with the farmer, and we're just really blessed with the both of them. Um, uh, and, and sorry, Barry, Barry's still prompting me. You can probably see these comments yourself, but yes, and of course, we're, we're very eco friendly, it's all very natural. I was talking about um, seeding the grasses in between the rows. Uh, we've got the bees now as well, which will um, be a huge benefit to, to, to the vineyard, both the vines and the, and the grasses in between them. Um, and and, and um, you know, those grasses are to help churn over the soils, uh, um, provide more. Um, uh, uh, oxygen, carbon dioxide, etc., etc. It's just, um, it's just really fascinating. Um, I'm getting a bit distracted now. Uh, sorry. Uh, well, have we talked about how lovely the 16 is? Oh, I haven't tasted it yet. I know, I know, Richard did early on, um, and he, I think he said it, it felt a bit richer almost. To me, this one has more of a licorice um, star anise um, up front than than perhaps the 17 has at this point. And a little bit more of the red fruits as well as the black fruits. Um, I don't know which one I like best. Um, David, are we selling honey? Not yet, but maybe one day. Um, we're just settling in our bees and, and they're there for the environment at the moment. But yes, hopefully one day we will be doing. Um, uh, Richard, which, which do you like best? I, I can't decide. I mean, we did this with the Chardonnay vertical, which I remember you joined. And I was able to decide, but I can't decide on this. It's a travesty that Barry's not here because Cabernet Sauvignon is his favourite, actually. He really ought to be hosting this rather than me. I think it's hard to tell. Probably the 16 because it, you know it is drinking so beautifully. The 17 is it's nice. It's got everything there. It's got the structure. And it's got the fruit. It's got the herbs. It's got the lovely um, soft tannins. It's got that sort of chalky minerality. But it's just going to get better. I think you know you want to buy a case of the 17 or um, or, or, or the celebration that I know you bought this morning, um, uh, Richard. You might want to lay down a couple of those 17s and enjoy the 16s a bit longer. Um, Yes, I agree. The 17 is going to be absolutely fantastic in a few years. It's, it's, and again, this is a quality, I think, again, of the vintage. It was a cooler vintage. Um, uh, the cooler climate, Cabernets do tend to um, age, a little, age a little longer or take a little longer to, to, to sort of hit their straps. Um, so so that's, not, that's not unexpected. Um, so, um, but, but yeah, both very nice. And, um, and pairing we talked about. What else do I need to talk about? What else shall we talk about? Um, uh, let's talk about... Um, what we just launched this morning, and, and uh, oh, David's going, Richard's going back to buy more. Thank you. Um, it's not released yet. The only way, you, so this is a good segue. Thank you. The only way at the moment that you can enjoy the 2017 and get your hands at the same time on some of the last of our stock of the 16 is to buy the um, uh, celebrating Cabernet Sauvignon, which we launched only this morning. And I know Richard, you hot footed it over to the tasting room and bought a pack. Uh, Lisa, let me know you've been in. Thank you so much. Um, there was also another wine wine club member. Obviously, received the mailer this morning and went straight online and purchased. So that was that was amazing. Um, so we do have it. If anybody else is interested, um, you can get hold of both vintages. It, it's online and it's available in the tasting room, both in Singapore and Australia. It's a six pack, um, and it's three of three. Um, and uh, and yes, yeah, it's, it's it's a lovely opportunity to do that. Um, we will be putting uh, what little we have left of the sixteen onto the museum palette in just a, sh a few short weeks. I, I reckon that we'll be rolling this vintage um, probably in five or six weeks at the very, very latest. So um, enjoy it. And we're only going to have this, this vertical for a limited time in the run-up to that. Of course, if you're a wine club member, you get your you get your 15% discount on that as well. Um, and, and actually, I, maybe I should mention, since we're all here, we have also, and hopefully um, the wine club members 
received an email about this too. We, we've moved to new software, which is going to bring us lovely, exciting things and the ability to, to, to offer you, uh, our happy customers and our lovely, loyal wine club members, all sorts of new and exciting um, benefits and opportunities with the benefit of this software. Uh, but it does mean that you need a new coupon now if you're a wine club member uh, when you check out in order to, get, to make sure you get your discount. So hopefully you received that, that email, um, David and Richard and others. Um, and if you didn't, just let us let me know and we'll make sure that, that you're, you're, you're not missing it so that you can enjoy your benefits. Um, David, thank you. Was it David? Or, no, Richard, thank you for the packaging. Yes, it's, we have a wonderful, um, we work with a wonderful illustrator and designer called Brett Layton in Perth um, who ha helped us from the get-go when we were thinking about our brand and thinking about our, reflecting our story in that beautiful logo. Um, and, and then he, with his help, he has consistently applied that across, you know, even, even our eco-friendly brand boxes. They're all so beautiful. And thank you. Really kind of you to mention that. I, I, I'm really, um, I love it too. It's, it's sort of, you receive the beautiful box. It's all exciting before you've even opened it. And then you've got the lovely label. And then inside, of course, hopefully you're finding some lovely wine. It's a lovely way to discover um, our, our small estate and our, and our low, low production wines. So thank you for mentioning that. Uh, David, no, the 16 is not yet sold out. The 16 is, is nearly sold out, which is why we're talking about the pre-release. Um, and, and what we do, uh, we do save back just a little bit each vintage, which we put on the museum palette. So in a few years' time, uh, you lucky wine club members will be able to go back and have some, some aged museum wines with us, and we'll roll those out in, in programs in future years. But it's just a small amount that we put to what we call the museum, um, um, at which point we're sold out for, for ordinary tastings and, and sales. But we're not there yet, so you can still get hold of it <laughs> at the moment, um, but not for much longer. Um, so uh, what else? How long have I been chatting away to you? Oh, half an hour already. Gosh, the time really flew. Um, I, well, maybe I should wrap it up then. That's half an hour. I, I've, probably, I've probably fulfilled my quota. Does anybody have any other questions or any comments they would like to make before, before we wrap it up and enjoy the rest of our bottles with, with a nice dinner? Um, sadly, Barry's in quarantine, so I won't get my usual lovely home-cooked beef tonight. But hopefully, yes, David, we, all we need now is for the WA borders to be opened. I absolutely agree. It's, um, we have luckily uh, been able to reopen our tasting room. Uh, we are doing tastings. It's a more limited offering at, at the moment um, than when we were shut down. Uh, just as we find our feet and get ourselves back um, into the groove in a way that's really safe for all of our customers and, of course, our staff. Um, but also, uh, really, hopefully, still, still a lovely tasting experience, um, uh, seated, guided. And, and, and exclusive in the way you, you know, you've know you come to expect. So, uh, But watch this space, because coming soon, we will certainly be rolling out some of our other experiences, some familiar, uh, such as Provenance Unearthed and the Nature and Wine Walk, um, and some new things, new surprises we have up our sleeve. Um, so um, watch this space. We'll keep you posted. And, and, and thank you so much. I really appreciate you all dialing in. Um, Again, I apologize that it's just me. I actually did have a dog sitting here, but the dog started misbehaving before we started rolling. So I, I thought just safest, since I've got two glasses to manage, to have him out of the way. Um, are we doing anything for cabin fever? Not officially, um, Richard, not this year. It's very difficult with, you know, with the limited um, opening, um, limited staffing, lim you know, the situation that we're dealing with post-COVID. So I'm afraid we're not doing anything this year. We did last year, of course, we did the winemaker's table last year. Um, and I hope we'll be back in future years with something special, but um, not for cabin fever this year. I, I think some other other estates have some things lined up though, so you should you should um, perhaps check that check that out. Um, Catherine, I'm so glad you're enjoying the 16. Thank you so much. I was a bit worried when you said that you could have all that alcohol on your nose at first, so that's good. Um, and thank you, David. Beautiful wines. I really appreciate it. And look, kudos again to our farmer and to our wonderful winemaking team, uh, Bruce and Remy, who are just uh, magic. Oh, Jenny, hi. Thank you so much to see you there too. Um, so look, I'll stop talking. It's going on. I'm going on and on. This is what happens when I have a drink. And um, just just to let you know that we are going to keep this going because so many of you have said we should, and you know that's wonderful to hear. Thank you, and we, so we will. Um, but we're not going to do it every two weeks because that's probably going to get a bit too much for you now that now that we know fewer people are locked down and and, and more of us are. Um, slowly returning back to um, you know, a bit more normality in our lives. But we're going to keep them going on the first Thursday of every month. So please mark your diary. I think it's something like the 2nd of August. Anyway, the, the Thursday in August, we have something pretty special lined up for that one. Um, we've got one of our lovely chefs that we work with um, joining us for that live ch wine chat. And, and I think that's going to be really exciting and, and a bit different. Um, so we'll, we'll, we'll look forward to seeing you all then. Enjoy the rest of your wine. And thank you so much, all of you, for joining me today. <laughs>